It's time for Branding Business, the only show that brings branding experts and corporate executives together to explore how branding your business can improve both your top-line growth and bottom-line performance. Brought to you by Rikus Baird. And now, here's your host. Welcome to Branding Business with Rikus Baird. I'm Ryan Rikus, and today's show topic is focused on how board members of a public company look at their corporate brand. Today's guest is Bala Iyer. Bala currently sits on five public boards, including Life Technologies, an S&P 500 global sciences company, and QLogic, a leading provider of data and storage networking solutions. As a board member, Bala has overseen more than 50 acquisitions valued at over $10 billion and equity and debt financing of over $5 billion. He was previously on the board of Overture Services when the company was acquired by Yahoo for $1.6 billion. Early in his career, Bala worked in Silicon Valley, primarily in the semiconductor industry for companies such as AMD and National Semiconductor. A little background here, Bala and I both serve on the board of Forum for Corporate Directors, which is focused on leadership in the boardroom. I've been very impressed by Bala and thought our listeners could benefit from his viewpoint of brand from the corporate boardroom perspective. So Bala, welcome to this edition of Brand New Business. Good to be on the show. Well, I'd like to begin by... uh, a general type question to really set the pulse for this uh, discussion, and that is uh, a view on the economy. And across the five boards and your involvement with other companies, is there a consistent viewpoint on business today? Uh, I'll give you an example where I'm coming from. The term cautious optimism was heard most commonly over the last few, year, few years. Are we still on that term, or is there a new mentality emerging? You know, Ryan, um, the, the term cautious optimism is probably what my companies would have applied in the early part of this year. Unfortunately, things have softened as we've entered the second half of this year. And uh, the demand environment is really tough in many of the end markets. And keep in mind, I'm speaking from the standpoint of technology companies. And uh, many of the companies have actually reduced their uh, forecast for the second half of the year. Uh, It turns out that there's maybe one exception to that, and that's the smartphone market. People continue to be absolutely crazy about upgrading their existing smartphones or those that don't have them, buying the latest iPhone or the Samsung Galaxy and such like. And so companies like Qualcomm and Skybrook Solutions, the company I'm on the board of, are actually doing quite well and are projecting double-digit growth. But many of my companies are actually... uh, actually being quite cautious, I think, is the operative word that most of the CEOs uh, would use about now. Do you think that uh, will become clearer as we go into the new year and the, hopefully the uh, resolution around the fiscal cliff has been uh, determined? Well, the, the fiscal cliff will certainly help clarify a number of different things in terms of the rules under which companies are going to operate. So there's no doubt that that will actually help uh, people think through their choices. But ultimately, it's going to be a question of demand. Uh, demand from uh, enterprise customers, demand from uh, consumers, and the state of the economy broadly, not just in the U.S., but uh, around the world. And you know, for many of my companies, uh, growth is coming largely from emerging markets. I mean, many of my companies look at uh, uh, China and India as the source of a very large percentage of the growth. So it's not just conditions in the U.S., which is what we traditionally have looked at, but also conditions in those economies when we look at how well the company is going to be doing in the second half of the year and beyond. I see. So those markets are softening as well. Yeah, there's no doubt. I mean, they are softer, but I think it's we live only in one true global village these days, and I think China takes its cue from the export economies in the developed world, in Europe and in the U.S., and uh, I think they're doing a lot to try and stimulate their own consumer demand, but it's still very much a, of an export-driven industry, an economy in China, as it is in India. And so uh, it, it's all pretty linked, but uh, it is something uh, that we're all monitoring very carefully. And I think that's part of what's going on with the way CEOs think about the business and why they're cautious. Uh, they tend to want to really meter their investment. and. It is true that a lot of companies are sitting on tons of cash, but there's a reluctance to actually invest when there's a concern about end market demand. Okay. Well, 
maybe I could transition the discussion here a little bit um, in reference to uh, how you as a board member look at the corporate brand. Now, I, I do fully realize that brand can be an overused word, and sometimes it's a little fuzzy, not always clear. So let's just associate it to the company's overall reputation and ultimately what that organization, a corporation, is known for. So with that context, how does a board view a company's brand and uh, your role as a board member in strategic oversight and governance? So, you know, as a board member, I think about the brand as the way in which a company differentiates their products or services in the markets in which they operate. So, for instance, in the technology businesses, it's often through product innovation, time to market, quality, reliability, and also, by the way, in this complex world that we live in, security of supply. So being able to um, separate yourself from the pack on one or more of these dimensions translates into real value, real value in terms of, uh, I'd say, increased sales, higher margins, higher stock multiples, and uh, ultimately increased shareholder value, which is what, uh, as a board member, uh, I tend to value all these things. As, as a board member in an oversight role, what I tend to focus on is that we are, as a company, investing to maintain or increase the source of our differentiation and improving our brand. Ultimately, if, if we establish that reputation and continue to grow that, we create value for the long term. Perfect answer. Uh, really good insight there. I have a question for you. We uh, have worked on uh, a number of technology brands, and most of the time the company uh, comes to us viewing the opportunity to differentiate themselves on innovation. And innovation seems to now to be an overused word, and, and I remember reading an article in Wall Street Journal about this topic saying, stay away from the term innovation unless you can fully uh, own a differentiation that is sustainable and that you have a, a corporate commitment to constantly being so far ahead of the competition that you'll be able to maintain that. Any feedback on that, that viewpoint? Well, look, in, in, the, uh, in the product businesses, which most of my companies are in, innovation is, is not really that hard to understand. It's you know, being able to uh, uh, get a better feature set, being able to, some, to get something out there that's faster, cheaper to use, a whole bunch of different parameters, and that's what most of my companies strive to, uh, to do. Uh, other dimensions like quality and, and such like, but uh, uh, it, it's, it's something that's pretty tangible that I can get my arms around. And the challenge, as you point out, is the product life cycles are not all that long in the case of the PC sector, in the case of the tablets, the phones. You know, your product life cycle could be a year. So it, you're on a treadmill, and particularly if it's a hot market like smartphones, everybody wants to win in it, and everybody wants to get in with an Apple, get in with a Samsung. So there's no doubt that it's a constant battle. Uh, but it's still the case that uh, the biggest source of differentiation can be product innovation in some of these businesses, and you've got to keep at it and try and figure out ways of staying ahead of the competition. Well, certainly Apple's uh, brand is about think different and product differentiation and constantly staying ahead of the competition and, and doing things, uh, you know, in, in, a, in a different manner. And, uh, you know, they didn't invent many of the devices uh, that they are famous for, but they've just made them better and, and approach it in that manner. And so their brand now stands for something that is, that is significantly different than the, uh, the more of the commodity type competition. So with that in mind, and it's been said many times that, that a company's most valuable asset is its corporate brand, do you agree or disagree with that comment? Well, you know, I, I, I look at, um, you know, the corporate brand as a result of a lot of different things that have been worked on over a period of time. And when you look at it in that sort of macro uh, context, I, I absolutely believe uh, in the value of the, the corporate brand. Well, Bala, how has your view of branding or, or corporate brand strategy changed uh, over the years? You have 30-plus years as a corporate executive or a board member, and, and I'm, I would imagine that uh, it, it's evolved and changed over the years. Can you, can you share a little light on that topic? 
So um, I, maybe what uh, the, the realization is that I've, I've reached over these many years is the, the extent of the work, the hard work over many, many years that goes into building a brand and the reputation for the company. What I've also realized is how quickly that brand and that mm -hmm. reputation can be destroyed. But the thing that I've seen in action is how a company reacts during a crisis has such an enormous effect on this, uh, the, the way the brand gets sustained beyond that particular event. So, you know, for instance, if you're a product company, you do have problems from time to time. You launch a product, particularly if you're trying to get there uh, first to market, there could be some issues. But lots of times, as soon as a customer brings that to your attention, your willingness to get in there and engage with them and work with them to solve the problem can have a lasting impact on the, on the customer's view of how you deal with things. And even though you start with a problem, the way in which you deal with that can really make a difference to that long-term relationship. That's a terrific insight, Bala. You're absolutely right. Uh, it, it begins with owning the problem and speaking about it in an open and honest manner. And uh, our experience has been is that people and companies will be able to relate to you if you treat it openly and honestly and transparently. And with the intent of fixing it and then overcoming it and re uh, resolving it, you actually have an opportunity to create a deeper customer relationship than one uh, that you might have had before. And if you don't deal with it openly and honestly, then your problems can multiply very quickly, like you mentioned. I think the thing to remember is that you know everybody has a problem or two. And you, you shouldn't look at, uh, you know, an issue that you have as, uh, uh, you know, uh, something is going to be a long-term problem. You've got to look at it as an opportunity to really set yourself apart from other companies that deal with problems and uh, make sure that uh, the, the customer really remembers how you dealt with it. Right. Well, and we always have to remember that branding is all about um, really clarifying, emphasizing, and differentiating your business strategy. And uh, at Rika Spirit, we're real passionate about how we can actually help drive business forward through business uh, or through brand strategies, and which result in a variety of different solutions, solutions that, uh, based upon research, built upon insight, and then brought to life through creativity. Now, they could be as simple as defining a corporation's evolved value proposition or the reality of a merger where two organizations are coming together and a new opportunity exists, a new story has to be told of what that new merged company stands for. And then even a more complexing problem is how to bring those two cultures together under one uh, unique now new story to tell. Uh, I'm sure that you have some experiences in that area of uh, acquisitions or mergers and uh, maybe you could give some insights on, on how you went about that process and, and then the role brand played in uh, communicating to everyone what this new uh, differentiation, what this new value proposition meant, not only to the marketplace, the shareholders, but then to the employees as well. So, um, actually, I've been living it with a couple of my companies that are very active in, uh, in M&A. Uh, and, and let me give you one example, which I think will uh, really read on some of these issues that you brought up, and that is uh, with Life Technologies. Life Technologies itself was created through the merger of two companies, and uh, two actually relatively large companies. Uh, Invitrogen, which was about a billion six in revenue, acquired Applied Biosystems, which is about $2.3 billion in revenue, and we paid somewhere around $5 billion or so uh, for applied biosystems. And these were both two very successful companies in their own right, uh, with strong cultures and uh, really a terrific track record and strong brands as well. It all started with, you know, what do we call ourselves as a company going forward? Uh, do we use the name in Vitrogen since that was the acquiring company? And there was a lot of thought put into this, and ultimately – the decision was made to uh, rename the, the combined company or uh, Life Technologies and to provide an overarching vision of what this company was going to be. And, uh, in fact, 
if you take a look at the uh, 2011 annual report, uh, it actually talks to the overall positioning of the company, and it provides really a way for people in both parts of the company, the acquired company as well as the original company, to get a sense of uh, who they are and who they will be uh, in the marketplace going forward. And I just uh, read you a couple of different uh, snippets. You know, it talks about life technologies shaping discovery and improving life. Another little snippet: we innovate, our customers break through, the world becomes a better place. Just imagine if you're somebody working within the company, how uplifting that vision of the company is. You take a look at uh, you know what happens in a merger, particularly one of equals as this one was, and dealing with cultural issues is actually one of the most important things that you have to do to create value through the merger. And creating an overarching company brand, uh, a statement of what the company is all about, and being able to go to every company site and articulating that in front of the troops makes all the difference in the world. We also had this other issue that we had multiple strong brands within the company. So, for instance, uh, we took our time really integrating the two companies. You know, the sales folks, and they're the customer-facing folks, for the longest time, in fact, for the first year, the Applied Biosystems sales force continued to do uh, their regular customer calls, and they had cards that read Applied Biosystems, a life technologies company. And the Invitrogen, the former Invitrogen sales force, had a card that said Invitrogen, a life technologies company. So we took our time to actually integrate that sales function and the customer-facing parts of the company. And over time, we've really consolidated that into a life technologies brand uh, facing the company. We didn't want to lose any of that customer intimacy that had been built up by the two sales functions. In fact, I think we took about two years to integrate the sales function itself. And even now, we maintain many of the brands that really had a terrific reputation over time. So, you know, we've had, for instance, Gibco, which was a brand that Invitrogen acquired 10 years ago that is still alive as a brand for the company. And we have uh, our bottles, reagent bottles labeled Gibco, a life technologies company. So, you know, there's a lot of effort that actually goes into bringing companies together during a merger to make sure that you don't lose any of the uh, sustaining value of the brands that have been built up over time. And I, I think that a lot of people tend to focus on mergers in terms of the actual deal and the deal announcement and all the work that goes ahead of when the new company is created. But as a board member, I'm most interested in really looking at the activities, the integration that takes place over a period of time after the deal gets done to create the most value. In the case of the, uh, of the life technologies, uh, the merger of applied bio and invitrogen, I think we had somewhere around a two- or three-year integration roadmap where we had some very specific integration goals, including Salesforce and branding and things like that, uh, that was assigned to each of the top execs. Well, Bala, um, clearly your experience uh, shines bright here because we as well get involved with a number of organizations who go through mergers and acquisitions, and it typically begins with um, how does the deal work out on paper? What are mm -hmm. the uh, cost savings of this, uh, this new combined entity as well as what is the new growth potential of this uh, entity? And, of course, it has to begin there, but soon uh, you have to start really looking at this ability to integrate as well as these, these two cultures. But we see that uh, unless there's someone experienced like you involved, that those components aren't really evaluated deeply enough until you get significantly down the path. Uh, but so I have to tell you, though, you know, uh, the, this, the, the team at Life Technologies uh, is terrific at integrating companies. And uh, it's great to have... Uh, folks who know what they're doing when it comes to, uh, to mergers, and it's a lot easier as a board than to entrust the capital of the firm 
uh, to uh, mergers and acquisition activity when you know people uh, uh, are out there who can lead that integration and the value creation activity. Well, you're absolutely right. If they have a culture of being able to do that and a proven track record, boy, they can really lean on that as a um, growth strategy, can you? Absolutely. Well, the example you gave was perfect, uh, the ability to leverage the existing brand equity from these organizations and then define a, a migration strategy using an endorsed brand like a life technologies company. Very, very effective. The thought around bringing cultures together is, as you mentioned, sometimes the biggest challenge of all. Any insights there you want to share with our listeners of how to integrate cultures together? Well, I think a lot of it starts with uh, a sense of fairness in terms of how the two companies get put together. So in, in the case of Life Technologies, for instance, we had very good representation from senior leadership of both Invitrogen and Applied Biosystems. We had uh, the leadership team very active and very visible among the troops. And for the first uh, six months to a year, they visited uh, you know, the, uh, various sites around the world multiple times, reiterating what the company was all about, communicating over and over again exactly how the two companies were going to come together. I talked about the pace at which we brought the uh, sales force together. Uh, likewise, we had a roadmap for how uh, we were going to integrate manufacturing. So I think communication communication, communication, is really making sure everybody is aware of what to expect and then following through and updating people as the various actions are completed. They're all extremely important. Yes, you're absolutely right. In this case, you had two brands, uh, well-known, very established, and yet you chose to uh, come up with a new name, and I think it's always easier to integrate both cultures under one new name rather than uh, one organization whose identity is going away. So it can be very effective, this method that you just used. And, and there was really a lot of thought put into it because uh, it was important that uh, you know, a deal of that magnitude actually succeed and create value. Yeah. Well, um, Bob, let me shift gears here a little bit, but uh, I'm interested in your background in finance and as a CFO and specifically on the topic of how you put a value on a brand. And, and the reason I bring it up... Um, Forbes just came out with its annual brand valuation ranking, citing Apple as the world's most valuable brand at $87 billion, just the value of the brand alone. Microsoft at $55 billion, Coca-Cola at 50 billion. In fact, technology brands dominated the top 100 with 24 of them making the cut, IBM at number 4, Google 5, and Intel 6. And their methodology was a combination of financial metrics, historical earnings, and their impact within the industry, their ability to differentiate, as well as consumer sentiment uh, and, and what consumers thought about the brand over a, a number of up to a dozen attributes. Any feedback or thoughts around that? Do you guys evaluate uh, as a board member the value of a brand at all, or, or is it really more of how these two brands can, can come together and, and uh, then become something completely different? Well, look, I'm, I'm a CFO and I'm a numbers guy, so I tend to look for an objective metric that I can use. And probably the best way I think about the value of a brand is to take a look at the profitability, uh, gross margin, um, you know, for instance, of a company relative to its peers as a pretty good proxy of how customers perceive the value that that company is bringing uh, into them. So, so for instance, I don't know if you are aware of this, but uh, I quite appreciate the comment being made about the value of the Apple brand. Uh, and and here's, here's why I think about it this way. I read some statistics, and I may have the numbers off a little bit, but order magnitude, they're going to be correct. Uh, it turns out that Apple, in terms of actual unit shipped, has maybe a 10% plus or minus kind of uh, unit share, maybe even a little less. But I've also heard that they end up generating somewhere about half the profits in the cell phone business. So if you take a look at the relative unit ship versus the, the relative uh, share of wallet in terms of profit margin they generate, it's unbelievable. So that's kind of the way I look at uh, the value of the brand. If, for instance, you're operating in the semiconductor industry and uh, 
the, let, let's say for the sake of argument, the average gross margin is 45% in the uh, semiconductor industry, and you come across a company that's generating consistently 55% gross margin, you'd have to look at that and say, these guys are doing something that their customers are willing to pay that extra 10% uh, of profits for. So that, to me, is the attractiveness of all of the collective work that goes into innovation you know, or whatever else goes into uh, that perception on the part of the customer and the willingness to pay. Well, I have about 10 more questions to ask you, but we're running out of time. Uh, so I'm going to conclude here with uh, just an open-ended thought in the sense that most of our listeners are comprised of a variety of different corporate executives, from CEOs to CMOs to salespeople. So under the topic of corporate brand strategy, is there any one piece of advice that you could offer them as a, as a final thought? Look, um, I, I know there are lots of companies that are having a uh, tough time right about now. You know, things are not that certain. There's a lot of uh, uh, issues that people are, are trying to work through. Uh, but I've got to tell you, I've been in the semiconductor industry for many, many years. It's a very cyclical business, lots of ups and downs. And it is one lesson I've learned. It is that the actions that you take during a downturn are really what determine your market position over the long haul. So here's the advice that I would have. Prioritize, focus, and invest in the two or three things that are key differentiators for the company during a downturn. And you will not have to worry about your market position over the long haul. That's terrific advice, and I think it goes well beyond the semiconductor industry. Well, Bala, thank you for being a guest on Brand New Business. If our listeners have any questions of you, how could they best reach you? Is there a, uh, an email address or a website or something they can go to to, to contact you? Sure. My email address is B-I-Y-E-R-O-C at yahoo.com. All right. Thank you for sharing that, Bala. Uh, terrific insights today. Like I said, I have so many more questions to ask of you, but just we ran out of time. So maybe uh, we can schedule another show down the road. All right. Thank you again, Bala. Thanks. Well, that concludes our show for today. This is Ryan Rikus, and you've been listening to another edition of Brand New Business with Rikus Baird. If you'd like to listen to the past shows or read our blog series, visit brandnewbusiness.com. Until our next show, stay focused. You've been listening to Branding Business, the only show that brings branding experts and corporate executives together to explore how branding your business can improve both your top-line growth and bottom-line performance. To hear more, simply visit our website, brandingbusiness.com, or tune in next week to learn how you, too, can build your brand and move your business forward. Brought to you by Rikus Barrett.